We have quite an assemblage of artifacts in this corner pertaining to World War I from wool uniforms up on top uh, with a Scottish brigade represented. There's a Canadian battery company, uh, the 43rd Canadian Battery. Uh, leggings, garters, dog tags, binoculars, Cameron Highlands cap, and a photograph of this particular gentleman wearing his uniform, including a kilt. Uh, purple heart. Uh, sheet music, the military waltz. There's a German gas mask. There's a coast artillery drill regulation book. Uh, leggings, canteens, a rucksack. All types of things, photographs, uh, photo albums, newspaper stories from the Boston Sunday Globe magazine. And of course, as Steve pointed out, this shell art from 40 millimeter shells and a 75 millimeter shell with a doughboy helmet with a finial attached to it right on top, <laughs> making a lamp. Very clever indeed. And of course, a doughboy outfit with the khaki uniform. Summer uniform. Yeah, it's a summer uniform with a Mounties cap, similar to what you see with the National Park Service Rangers when they wear this. Uh, there are portraits and more doughboy helmets, uh, different types of watches and watch fobs, <laughs> and of course the World War I arms and bayonets up here on the wall. And we have an assortment of helmets, camouflage, and British and American. This is a fabulous collection. And we have lots more to go see as we make our way around this building. We haven't got our, even gotten the World War II. We barely, we barely we scratched the surface. Right now we're going to see the World War II exhibits next. Let's move on. Now over here we have a, a trench kit with a rather lethal brass, looking weapon here. Brass knuckles. Brass knuckles with a dagger. That was for trench warfare. Wow. U.S. 1918, look at that, with the canteen mess kit. The LSMs, there were a whole series of ships that began with L. There were LSTs, LS, LSIs, LSMs. Each one had a different purpose, but the LST was the one that many soldiers dreaded the most. I don't know about that. Because of their flat bottoms crossing the Atlantic and the Pacific? Is that better? I don't know. No. These were terrible. These were the ships every guy feared because of their flat bottoms. They would roll. They were notorious for rolling. And these ships carried thousands of men across the ocean, both the Army and the Marines, Coast Guard. In fact, during wartime, most of these ships were manned and staffed by Coast Guard members, right. carrying other military forces with them. And more often than not, the men aboard these ships, even on a calm day, were seasick <laughs> virtually most of the day. So rather than eating meals, they, they lived off of sausage sandwiches and fruits and vegetables, things that wouldn't upset their stomachs too much. They were, they were just notorious, but uh, ships of this type here would have carried the tanks, the trucks. You're noticing the deep bay here in the center. These are transports for machinery and mobile units. And of course, they had gun batteries surrounding the ship, 40 and 50, 40 and 50 millimeter cannons all the way around. They may have, in this scale here, they may look like machine guns, but they're actually uh, foot-operated cannons. I served on a ship in the Navy that had a similar gun, 40 millimeter, with a shell about 40 millimeters long. And they had an effective range of about six miles. Not very accurate, but if you pumped enough of those in any given direction, you sure to hit your target. And of course, they had the K, uh, the K-Proc life rafts. These would stay afloat for a short period of time. If a ship went down and you had to get to the life rafts, this is what you had. You'd be constantly soaking wet because of the web bottom. And if the web bottom gave way, you became shark food, especially in the South Pacific, as with the case of the USS Indianapolis. When that ship was sunk by a Japanese submarine, they didn't have time to get to the life rafts. And of over 900 crewmen, less than 300 survived if that. But we have a variety of photographs here. Can you tell me about something about these people? Okay, these are all women who served in the military. 
at different times, World War II, Korea, and whatever. And here we have an enlisted female uniform. This would be a day type wear for the office or that's, that's a whack. some non-official duty. And of course, the official uniform for an officer. Yep. This woman would have been a lieutenant commander, noticing the two wide stripes and the half stripe in the center. And then we have a Marine yep. enlisted. That's the classic female Marine uniform, yep. Army lieutenant. Yep. And this was another wave for the U.S. Navy. She was a first-class petty officer, yeoman, or clerk. And she had approximately 16 years of service under her belt. One stripe. They call these hash marks. One for every four years. Right. Yep. I'm surprised. I didn't realize they used the overseas caps. Yeah. Not commonly seen. But. And they have changed to a slight degree. They, uh, the Navy changed all of their uniforms during the oh, yeah. 70s and 80s. And nobody liked them. Absolutely nobody. We had khakis and yeah. chinos. That was yep. it. And of course, we have other types of ships here. Transport ships that carried tanks. Again, this is another flat bottom here. Mostly for uh, machinery and mobile weaminry. And your torpedo boat? Yep, torpedo boats were very fast. Very. And the PT boat, this is a classic. If you went down to the Fall River Battleship Cove, they have, one. They have a separate building in there with uh, various degrees of restoration going on with PT boats. Uh, some of them, they just have the bow area. Some have only maybe the, uh, the bridge, if you will, the control center. But there is one intact. Uh, petite PT boat down there in Fall River, which you can walk over. They've right. specially designed a boardwalk, right. so you can't touch the vessel itself. I've seen an article about it. I've never yeah, seen very that. fast, very swift, high speed, built of plywood. <laughs> and this is exactly the type of PT boat. This is uh, that John F. Kennedy would have uh, been on board during World War II and during his famous expedition, when he and his men ended up in the water and was stranded on an island. And we have uh, the Lionfish submarine. We have a hospital ship, Navy supply, uh, probably an ocean liner. Several ocean liners were converted so. to carry troops, like right. the Queen Elizabeth and the Normandy, the United States, and many others, where they were taken over by the U.S. Navy. That's a World War I machine gun. It belongs in the World War I section. It's a water cooled. A water cooled machine gun. This is the type that they had to literally sit on the ground. Low profile. And what are the data on this? Automatic only, recoil operated, water cooled. It's uh, rated as a 7.62 millimeter heavy ball. It's a Russian. 185 gram bullet, 50 gram charge. Wow. A muzzle velocity 2,830. Feet per second. That's over half a mile. A second. <laughs> what and a weapon. The, Boy, I'd hate to lug it the around. Took a, <laughs> took a capacity of a 250 round fabric belt. This is 52.8 pounds unloaded, just the gun itself. The total weight of this gun with its carriage is 99.71 pounds with a shield and water. This is 43.6 inches long. The barrel itself is 28.4. Four grooves with a right hand twist. And the capacity of firing here, 520 to 580 rounds a minute. And the effective range, 1,100 yards. And the Soviet Army utilized this particular weapon during the Finnish-Soviet Winter War of 1939-1940. And the Finnish army captured the weapon during that conflict. Amazing. I still wonder how it got here. <laughs> <laughs> Finnish army, my ancestors. <laughs> <laughs> here we have some more German and Japanese artifacts. We have a regimental flag, I believe. We have German and Japanese. Oh, yes.
Now, the, uh, the Americans quite frequently in the Pacific captured uh, Japanese flags that basically were called blood chits. Oh, really? Yes. I don't really know what the name meant, or but there was a name given to them. I'd like to figure that part out a little bit more. Probably Here we have an army occupation patch for Austria. E for efficiency. The 22nd Coast Artillery. Yep. Then we have a combat infantry badge, the blue. Okay. The Kentucky Long Rifle. What is the one with the panther? The what? The panther, the black panther here. Was that a German thing? I don't think so. It wouldn't be with an American uh, no. CIV. No. Hmm. Now, that might have been a division emblem of some I sort. I would guess the regimental yeah. thing or something again. We have a Japanese battle flag from World War II, a Japanese news magazine. Is a World War II flag. Yeah, that's the ruptured duck again. Yep. And we have a Japanese flag here with a lot of Japanese inscriptions. Might be prayers or names of family members. Unless we had an interpreter, we wouldn't know. That's out of my realm. Yeah. Wow. And again, these are all made and served from Greater New Bedford, World War II. Oh, this is something I've always been curious about. The, uh, in the aftermath of World War II, Sagamo prison in Japan, how some of the most infamous Japanese war criminals, including Premier Hideki Tojo, mm -hmm. I'd heard of Tojo many times, yep. and I tour guy, Dikino, better known as Tokyo Rose, Tokyo Rose, Ro yes, Tokyo Rose, pardon my tongue here, was a woman who broadcast all types of messages to the Allied forces during World War II, trying to demoralize them, telling them how their wives had left them and their sweethearts had abandoned them. Um, she did everything possible. Well, they played beautiful music, but she would sound these little blurbs in between musical sequences over the radio. It says, in all, over 2,000 war criminals and protected witnesses were held at Sagamo, and almost 60 prisoners were executed, and others were sentenced to prison terms. Not enough. No. This is the fellow I was telling you about. Four brothers served in World War II, father served in World War I, and he served in during Korea. the Korean War. Yep. Foster family. Wonderful collection. Shooting. Wonderful collection. Yeah. Wow. Absolutely wonderful. And we have a pair of World War II <laughs> boots. Oh my word, they're the well worn. <laughs> the U.S. Army knife, flare gun, and canisters. And they, it's a flare gun. National Guard commemorative medallion. Overseas caps, cameras, uh, wonderful. Old uh, Kodak type, I don't. The Contesso Nettis or Nettle. 110? <laughs> yeah. Contessa Nettle is the name of the camera, but it's reminiscent of the old Bellows type Kodak with the gla plate glass negatives. Yep. That's amazing. We have a safe conduct pass for German soldiers. Okay, the German soldier who carried the safe conduct. He's using it as a sign of his genuine wish to give himself up. He is to be disarmed, to be well looked after, to receive food and medical attention as required, and to be removed from the danger zone as soon as possible. Dwight D. Eisenhower, Supreme Commander. Wow. That's great. Here we have a British sailor's cap, the USS Dartmouth. And Her Majesty's Submarine Force. And a Panzer Faust tank killer. Oh. German tank killer. Yep. Panzer it's a German Faust. tank killer. This was, I believe, fired? Panzer Faust. Okay, fired from a tank. Yeah, it's a oh, tank. Oh, my word. Anti tank gun. Wow. 
That's the one you see with the Germans, uh, with their youth and kid, old men at the end of the war. We hear about RPGs, rocket-propelled grenades. This is a large-scale model of one of those. To disarm a tank or to disable a tank. That was their bazooka. We came out with a bazooka. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And this was fired from under the arm. Yeah. Oh, my word. You held it more like a, a shotgun. You yeah. It was fired. Held like this, under the arm, and fired like a shotgun. Rather than shoulder fire. And this, this part here that took would off. release itself from the tube, and you'd fire that at a tank, maybe at its tracks under, underneath it to get to the belly of the tank. Either way, trying to disable that tank as best you can. And here we have a mortar on top. Yep. Still in use, I believe. 